So we are now just one week away from Kamala Harris's big speech at the Democratic National Convention, where her campaign is expected to get another polling bump. But right now, I want to take some time to talk about where she's at currently, because multiple polls indicate that she is continuing to surge. And on top of that, she's defying everyone's expectations and key metrics. So let me show you what I mean. So a poll conducted by the New York Times and Siena College finds that Harris is now leading Trump in three key battleground states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Now her lead is within the margin of error, so keep that in mind, but contrast her numbers with Biden's numbers from May, and you can see he was losing in all three of those states. Now again, he was losing within the margin of error as well, but the trend here is really positive for Harris, obviously. Now, if you look at new polling released by Cook, you can see that she's drastically improved in swing states over Biden since May. So let's focus on the left side where they include third party candidates, which I think gives you a more accurate picture of the race. So as you can see, Harris is now leading in Arizona by four points. Trump was ahead of Biden by four points in May. She's now tied in Georgia, whereas Trump was ahead by four in May. Now, when it comes to Michigan, she's up by two. In Nevada, Trump's up by five, but he was up by eight. So we've seen some improvement there. Now in North Carolina, Harris is up by two, whereas Biden was down by eight in May. Now this is a red state. So this is pretty big. In Pennsylvania, a must-win state, Harris is now up by five, and Biden was down by three in May. Now in Wisconsin, she's up by five. Biden was tied with Trump in May. So needless to say, she has made significant improvement since May. Now, the effect of third parties is also really interesting. So in most states, Harris does better when you include third parties, which indicates that RFK Jr. is pulling a significant number of voters away from Trump. And the only two states where Trump actually does better when you factor in third party candidates are Nevada and Michigan, which makes sense since Michigan is where the uncommitted movement originated. So Harris still has some work to do there in terms of making the uncommitted committed. And that requires a very clear message on Gaza. So I hope that she improves there. Now, when it comes to Nevada, she's also running behind according to this poll. But I actually do think that she can pull off a win there since Biden did narrowly win that state back in 2020. But putting aside those caveats, this poll represents a substantial swing in Harris's favor since May. Like, this is shocking. She's only been a candidate for a couple of weeks now, less than a month, and she's made that much improvement. That is huge. You cannot overstate how well she is currently doing. Now, there's another number that's improved for her, her approval rating. But the good news doesn't stop there because when it comes to voter trust in the economy, Republicans have always had an advantage here. But Harris, for the first time that I can remember, has taken the lead on that front as well. And I say this because a Financial Times poll finds that a plurality of voters now trust Harris more on the economy than Donald Trump. I'll say it again. Voters now trust a Democrat more than a Republican on the economy. This is absolutely shocking and utterly devastating for Donald Trump because Republicans have always had an advantage in polling when it comes to the economy. But right now, because of Harris, that is starting to change. Now, I think that Kamala can actually turn this plurality into a majority if she continues to promote progressive economic policies, because as much as Republicans scream socialism, understand that most Americans don't agree with their fear mongering. Most Americans support progressive policies as evidenced by this data for progress poll which finds that policies like expanding Medicare, cutting drug prices, taxing the rich, expanding Social Security, rent caps, the child tax credit, affordable housing, raising the minimum wage, capping child care costs, eliminating medical debt, Medicare for all, free college, and the PRO Act, they all have majority support. Now, Kamala Harris has leaned into some of these policies, but if she were to lean into all of them, she could be unstoppable. Now, she's since moved away from Medicare for All after initially supporting it in 2020, which I find thoroughly disappointing. And I think the reason why she got cold feet is because she got attacked by Republicans and the media for wanting to abolish private insurance. But I think that she should have trusted her initial instinct because Medicare for All has always been a really popular policy. And it's one of the few issues that really galvanizes the Democratic Party's base. And if she were to frame Medicare for All as an economic policy and tell people that they're effectively paying a private tax, to insurance companies and Medicare for all would save them money and give them better health care. I'm telling you, sky's the limit.
this is a change election and i think that she knows this is a change election so she shouldn't be afraid to embrace really bold policies like medicare for all but with that being said she's ahead of trump on the economy which is undeniably impressive so whatever she's doing we need to see more of that because it's working now here's where things take a shocking turn and even i'm shocked by this kamala harris is doing so well that some red states are now in play that includes North Carolina, as you saw with the Cook poll. And as Axios reports here, she's now statistically tied with Trump in North Carolina. And if she were to win this state, she'd be the first Democrat to pull off a victory here since Obama in 2008. Now, perhaps even more shocking, Florida is now officially in play again. A USA Today Suffolk poll found that Harris is just five points behind Donald Trump, just outside the margin of error. Now, when I saw this, I assumed that the poll was an outlier. That is, until a Florida Atlantic University poll found that she's actually just three points behind Donald Trump. And get this, two points behind Donald Trump when you factor in RFK Jr. Two points. That is astonishing. But here's where it gets even worse for Donald Trump. There is an abortion measure on the ballot in November, which is definitely going to drive turnout among women, which means Harris could get a boost from them as well. So if she really is just two points behind Donald Trump, those women could easily put her over the edge. This is huge. So Florida is officially in play. Now, whether or not she actually is able to win is an entirely different story, but it's in play. And even if she still isn't able to win that state, the fact that she's so close forces Trump to play defense and pour resources into a state that typically isn't competitive. He is now forced to divert attention away from swing states that he needs to focus on in order to shore up support in a state that is theoretically safe for him, right? So it's it's not good news for Donald Trump, and that's 30 electoral votes that he absolutely cannot lose. So the fact that it's even this close should horrify him. But I do want to take a step back and look at some aggregate polling data to get a better sense of where she's at nationally. So average polling data from Real Clear Politics puts Harris ahead of Trump by about a point on average, which is lower than it was last week on Real Clear Politics. Although she has expanded her national lead in 538 polling averages, and we talked about this last week, but I I think that the variation here is due to which polls these two aggregators include. 538 doesn't include junk polls like Rasmussen, so I tend to think that they offer a better snapshot of where voters are. Now, an average provided by Nate Silver gives her a slightly bigger national lead at about three points on average, but overall, the trend nationally is moving in her favor. Now, keep in mind that this is all just a snapshot in time and polls do tend to tighten as the election gets closer. And even though Kamala Harris has officially taken the lead, that doesn't necessarily mean that she's definitely going to win this election because things can change between now and November. And the support that she's seeing in polls might not actually translate into actual votes. So you never want to assume that the polls are foolproof and definitely going to indicate who is and isn't going to win, but they do offer us a good sense of where things are headed. And at this point, you cannot deny that Kamala Harris is absolutely surging. And that is really encouraging, especially after we all thought that a Trump victory was inevitable just like a month ago, right? Now, one thing I want to talk about is Trump doing good in one metric. And that is, he's not as hated as he was in 2020 and 2016. This is what Harry Anten of CNN has talked about and is why he's cautioning voters into reading too much into the polls currently because Trump isn't as disliked. Now, that might change as time goes on. He still has a net uh, unfavorable approval rating, whereas Kamala Harris is now breaking even and Tim Walz is uh, plus five or six and even 12 or 13, depending on the poll. So. That's one thing to keep in mind. The anti-Trump fervor that we saw in the last elections might not play as big of a role, but the question is, why is Harris doing so well? Why is she defying expectations? And the answer is that she has improved her numbers among demographics that Biden was starting to lose. That includes black and Latino voters. That includes young voters. But also, surprisingly, it includes non-college educated white voters who tend to skew Republican. Now, CNN's Harry Enton gives us some insight into this phenomenon. Trump still leads. But look at that margin. It has shrunk significantly. It was 25 points back in May. It is now 14 points now here in August, nearly been sliced. 
by half. Those numbers that Harris is putting up amongst that group right now are actually slightly better than Joe Biden did four years ago amongst those voters in those key states. Those are the types of numbers that Kamala Harris needs to put up in order to win. And of course, Joe Biden was like, I don't want to drop out of the race because I'm not sure that <clears throat> Kamala Harris can break in with this group, but it turns out she absolutely can. Which is fascinating because originally when they started, right, it was an immediate map expansion. They started looking at Georgia, North Carolina even, uh, not giving up, but it seemed like sort of accepting that yeah. conventional wisdom. Correct. And now it's fascinating that may not be the case. So um, also the economy, when we look at that, we just were talking about that. That's an issue Trump has been extremely strong on. Is that changing? It is. I mean, again, look, we're still looking at Trump having a clear advantage amongst white working class voters in you know, the great like battleground states. But again, the margin is shrinking and elections are all about margins. You see it shrinking at a 36 point advantage in May. It's now down to 24 points here in August. These are the types of numbers that Kamala Harris needs to put up. And more than that, you know, it's yeah. about the economy. This is also a change election and it's also about change as well. And she's breaking through among white working class voters on yeah. the issue of change. So the economy and change working for her cohesively. You're talking about Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin there. Obviously, those are crucial. That's that blue that blue wall. Um, but when you look more broadly, does this tip the scale as you look at other crucial must-win states? A absolutely. Absolutely. Non-college whites are a key group across the board. They are plurality of voters in the electorate when you compare them with college-educated whites or if you compare them with African-Americans and Hispanics, and especially in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, look at that. They're the majority of voters. The fact that Harris is closing in on Trump with them is the big reason why she has those advantages she has now in those New York Times, Siena College. Absolutely polls. fascinating, there. and not what, what probably anybody expected no. from what Joe Biden was saying. But a that welcome thing for Democrats, thing. definitely. So Harris is expanding the Democratic Party's coalition in ways that Biden simply could not, and her appeal is way more broad than anyone expected it to be, so much so that she's now cutting into to Trump's base. That right there speaks to the strength of her candidacy, but it's not just about her. Yes, she's doing good, but Trump is also doing bad. And part of the reason why he's doing so bad, aside from a piss poor campaign he's running, is that the strategy that he previously deployed against Biden has now blown up in his face because he initially tried to make this election a referendum on Biden's age and mental acuity. But now that Biden is out of the race, voters are still thinking about age and mental acuity. And shocker, they're all looking at Donald Trump right now. Republicans wanted to make this about age and mental acuity, and it still is. And that's hurting him. That's why I think demographics who are usually more favorable to Republicans are moving towards Harris because age is a very important factor to them. Now, I'm going to play another clip from Harry Anton who's going to explain why this is happening. That was working for Donald Trump earlier on this campaign when his opponent was Joe Biden. Why? Too old to be president. Look at this. 78 percent of voters said in May that Joe Biden was too old to be president. But now the age issue is working against Donald Trump. Why? Because Kamala Harris is now the Democrat nominee. Look at this. Just 11 percent of likely voters say Kamala Harris is too old to be president. Now, if we come on to the other side of the board, look at that difference with Donald Trump. Look at this now. 58% of likely voters say Donald Trump is too old to be president. Now, that's up a little bit from May when it was 53%, but that 53% compared to 78% looked pretty gosh darn good. But now that 58% compared to the 11% for Kamala Harris, very bad news for Donald Trump. The messaging that Donald Trump and his campaign have been putting forward earlier on this campaign has been flipped upside down. She's only 59, but okay. You can get 11% to agree on anything. 11% of people believe the moon landing is faked. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, is it just about the age or is this about the message, the change? that this might bring in. Yeah, all right. So you know what? We talk about age, but I think age is also a stand-in for change. And this is a change election. Look at this. Political or economic system in this country needs at least major change. Look at this. Two-thirds of likely voters in the key battleground states of Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin believe that, in fact, the political and economic system in this country needs at least major change. Just 33 percent believe that it needs minor or no change. So the key nugget in this campaign is to be the candidate of change. If you are the candidate of change, you will win. And who is leading on that front, the yeah. candidate of change? Right, exactly. The age issue is working against Donald Trump. The change issue is now working against Donald Trump. We'll bring the right time, kind of change. Again, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin among likely voters. Look at this. Kamala Harris at 51 percent. Close by is Donald Trump at 47 percent. What I will note, Sarah, is these numbers look 
identical, basically, to what we see in the horse race, which was Harris ahead by four points. And you're seeing that right here on we'll bring the right kind of change. Harris ahead again by four points. So all of a sudden in this campaign, a campaign that has been about age and been about change, it was working for Donald Trump and now it is working against him. And that is why Kamala Harris has all this momentum. Very interesting. Now to expand on what Anton is saying here, when Biden was still in the race, he was the incumbent and voters were dissatisfied with him. And they thought that the country was headed on the wrong track and his approval rating dipped into the 30s, which is very, very bad for a sitting president who wants to be reelected, which is why he was losing. Now, in that dynamic, Trump was viewed as the change candidate who was offering voters something other than the incumbent. Even though he was a president himself, he was still the alternative. And voters usually gauge who they're going to vote for based on how they're feeling right now. So if they feel like they don't like the way that things are going, they blame the president. Republican, Democrat, they blame the president and they vote for the other party. Voters aren't as partisan as we'd all like to think, right? They're much more mushy and uh, malleable. But now Harris is widely viewed as the change candidate because even though she's the vice president, she's not a former president. So she has the opportunity to chart a totally different path. And whether or not voters want change is always going to be something that we have to look out for. Because back in 2008, remember, Obama literally ran on change after eight years of Bush and the disastrous Iraq war. And then after eight years of Obama, voters were fed up again with the establishment and they felt like Hillary Clinton was the ultimate establishment insider, whereas Trump then represented a, a change to the status quo. Now in 2020, a global pandemic hit and that changed all of our lives. And Trump couldn't meet the moment and voters once again wanted change they wanted somebody in office who would act like an adult and handle the public emergency with the seriousness that it warranted now once again we are in a situation where voters are feeling economic anxiety and they're worried about the trajectory the country is on and they want change and since harris represents change that's why she has so much momentum in her favor and so long as voters continue to see her as change and she continues to push this narrative that she's the change candidate i think this momentum can continue now the only question is how long can she sustain this momentum can she sustain this momentum all the way until November 5th. Now, it's difficult to say. Nobody knows for sure. Again, usually polls tighten up as we get closer to the election. But I will say, as it stands right now, Harris is in a really good spot, and she is defying everyone's expectations. And if she keeps this up, she could win. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? 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 <laughs> tree? Tree? You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs>